Praise the Lord this morning. Praise the Lord for worship and praise. Praise the Lord for a word from Eric to get us started. Praise the Lord for his glory, for his majesty, for his mercy, for his grace. Thank you for his patience. What more patient person is there? There's not one. Than the Lord. This morning, our sermon title is, What Are You Waiting For? I heard that. That's how I felt about it when he gave it to me. (laughs) Uh, We're going to be reading in Exodus chapter 3 through Exodus chapter 4, verse 17. It's a large reading, but before we get into that, we'll be focusing, obviously, on Moses. And Moses is in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. He's celebrated for his faith and his works and the way that he obeyed the Lord. But when you read these first little chap- couple of chapters, Moses almost never got started. Everybody say the number five. Say five. five. That's how many times Moses was like, eh, I don't know. Before the Lord propelled him forward and he did operate faithfully in the Lord. Like many servants of God, the path for Moses was very, very difficult. Moses, I don't think, had any idea what was in front of him. And I think that's where some of his fear, trepidation, or his, his delay came from. But God doesn't always ask us to do easy things. God doesn't measure the difficulty of the things he's asking us to do. He measures the righteousness of the things he's asking us to do. He wants us to respond obediently and faithfully because he has asked us. <clears throat> Again, it's just going through the Bible in a year plan. This is where this hit me and just started brewing about a week, week and a half ago. And I've read it so many different times and, and just seeing time after time after time after time, Moses giving excuses, giving reasons, giving objections, giving co- uh, concerns, fears. And how many times do we do that? I mean, Eric's what he just preached on is a perfect example of that. Well, that guy's been mean to me. He doesn't like me. So you stop. That's not what the Lord said to do. How many times does the Lord ask us to do something and we come up with these excuses? We come up with these things. We come up with reasons why we can't get started. We come up with reasons why we can't obey faithfully and allow the Lord to work through us. We come up with that a lot. So as we read through these, I want you all just to think about the times when you've used some of these type of excuses, these type of reasons in your life when you haven't responded properly. The goal today is to show how easy our flesh can give us excuses. To show us how easy we can give in to those excuses when we focus on the wrong thing or the wrong person. And show how important it is to rebuke these excuses and get started on the things that the Lord has called you to. Let's turn to Exodus 3, beginning in verse 1. We've got a lot of reading this morning. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the truth, the power, the consistency, the constancy of your word, Lord. We pray that it's true no matter what. We pray that we can lean on it. We pray that we thank you that we can use it as a flashlight for our lives, Lord, that the more we study, the more we intake, the more we receive, Lord, the better we are at serving you and growing in faith, growing in righteousness, Lord. Help this word, Lord. Help me to preach it clearly. Lord, help us to be attentive to what you have for each and individual person, Lord. Just pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from amidst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn. Verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now before, or excuse me, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, What am I that I should go? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have thought, excuse me, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The children of your fathers has sent me to you, excuse me, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel today, together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice. And you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Verse 19, But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall go that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they won't believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out, and behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even those two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have I not the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. Verse 13. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand whomever else you may send. 
So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what to say, which will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, which with, with which you shall do the signs. There's a lot of things going on there, but there's five different rebuttals, excuses that Moses gives. And I want to go through each one of those and just show how easy it is to, to lose our focus on the right thing. Forget who's asking us what to do, and we'll get into it. So excuse number one, questioning God's plan. If you look at Exodus 3, verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children out of Egypt? Do you see the irony here? Moses was a Hebrew. He killed an Egyptian taskmaster for beating other Egyptian, or excuse me, other Hebrews. So he knows what they were dealing with because it infuriated him. And now God has given him an entire plan. God has very clearly said, I have heard their cry. I have seen the oppression, and I want to deliver them, his own people. You would think that Moses would be excited and say, yeah, I want to go forward. I want to be used by you. I want to be a part of this plan. But no, he says, who am I? We do this today, don't we? We find ways to work ourselves out of service. Well, I'm not ready. Well, I've never done that before. I don't have time. When you think about things that haven't been done before, Martin Luther had never done a 95 thesis and packed it on the Roman Catholic Church door before. How hard was that, understanding what the Roman Catholic Church was at that time? Yet he still did it. Moses was focused on the difficulty of the task at hand, the unsurety or the unsureness of the task at hand. He was not focused on who was calling him. He lost sight of it being God's plan for him to respond. And we can too. We don't operate, just like Eric said, we operate out of faith. And if we operate out of faith to the Lord, responding when he has called, he will give you what you need. God is in charge. It's his plan, and we are the pieces of the puzzle that he wants to use how he wants to use us. He will place us where he wants you to be placed, and he will ask you to do something when he wants you to do it. We don't get to pick and choose and say, well, how about Tuesday? I don't really do stuff on Monday because I've tired from Sunday. Worship and praise was off the chain. No. We don't get to choose. We choose to follow the Lord, and that means follow him no matter what. And what was God's response? Personally, this is why I'm not God. I might have smoked Moses. <laughs> I, I mean, I just gave you, like, I'm going to a Hebrew who killed an Egyptian for beating up on the Hebrews, and now I'm going to rescue your people. And you're like, mm. but he says what? I will be with you. As patient and as loving as he can be, I will be with you. God will be with you in whatever he calls you to. It's his plan. Why would he leave you astray and leave you out there to do your own thing? It's not your thing. You're doing his thing, and he's going to be with you when you're doing his thing. Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Will is future tense. So whatever you face, he is and he will be there. Do not question the Lord's plan. Embrace it. <clears throat> Excuse number two that we see from Moses. It's just fascinating. Like I said, we were reading this through the, the Bible in a year plan, and it's the importance of continuing to stay in the word every single day. Whether you do the Bible in a year once a year or twice a year, whatever your, whatever your desire is there, the stuff, the more you read it, the more it's just filtering into you. Anyway, 
It's, I've read this before, but it's not stood out the way that it stood out this time. Excuse number two, forgetting the glory and the power of God. Exodus 3.13, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I have come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Go back just a little bit to the earlier verses. When Moses encounters the burning bush, he hears the voice of the Lord. The Lord clearly identifies himself to Moses. Take your sandals off. This is holy ground. Watch your step, right? He declares himself who he is, and Moses just kind of forgets. He gets so focused on the task or the potential difficulty of the task. He doesn't even know the fullness of the task yet, and yet he's still allowing himself to focus on that potential difficulty rather than hearing the Lord and saying, okay, I, I don't know what we're going to do here, but I know I've heard the Lord, and I need to do it. And G <clears throat> excuse me, God proves himself again if you look at 5 and 6. Or excuse me, I'm sorry. Verse 5 and 6, he identifies himself again. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look on God. There was no confusion on Moses' part about who was talking to him. It happens to us, too. We know when the Lord has asked us to do something. Because it's when you don't want to do it, it feels like that pesky fly that you can't, you're kind of trying to shoot away. Like, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to do this right now. It's too hard. Like Peter, when he took his focus off of Jesus when he was walking on water and began to sink. Moses was focused on the difficulty of the task rather than the provider of the task. Moses lost his sight of the power of the living God. There is no challenge greater than God. He has conquered everything. So why would we think that he wouldn't be with us to conquer whatever he's asked us to do in that moment? Psalm 145.3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. He's so great, we don't even know how great he is because we, we, we can't fathom that greatness. But we know it's there. Don't forget the glory and the power of God. He is the one that is doing the sending of you to accomplish his purpose. Excuse number three, the what ifs. Exodus 4.1, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Put another way, what if they don't buy it? What if they think I'm crazy? What if what I'm saying is just a bunch of gobbledygook and they don't want to hear it? He's projecting on to the recipient that he's supposed to be talking to. That's not his job. His job is to speak. Their job is to receive or reject. He's getting ahead of his skis. He's forgetting he is only responsible for his actions. He's only responsible for his response. He's only responsible for his obedience. He isn't the author of the plan. Sometimes we like to promote ourselves within the plan, and we're not supposed to be promoting ourselves within the plan. We like to, to have sort of a dialogue as though it's a relationship where we can toss ideas back and forth, and it's not really that. <laughs> When the Lord asks you to do something, that is what he wants you to do. It's not a, well, what about? <laughs> and again, don't we do the same? For, I guess, about eight months now, we've had the prayer list going around for the lost loved, one, lost loved ones. We've had a, a bigger focus on those. And when you think about witnessing those to the close, those closest to you, it, those typically are the harder relationships to try to get through. You know them, you know their history, they know you, they know your history. Jason's mentioned this before, where sometimes people forget who you are now. They like to focus on who you were before. 
and sometimes that can side rail things. And so when we, these what ifs that can pop up when we're talking about those close to us or anyone for that matter, could even be a stranger. What if they don't like what I have to say? What if they reject me? What if they don't let me finish speaking? What if they laugh at me? What if I ask what if they ask something I don't know? How many use that one? <clears throat> what if I mess up? What if I misspeak? What if I stumble? What if I stutter? What if they don't believe me? Again, we have to be careful to project onto anybody else their response or their potential response. We have to just say, okay, Lord, this is highly uncomfortable, but because you told me to do it, I'm going to trust that you want me to do it, and I'm going to trust that you're going to help me do it. I'm going to let my faith in you, the knowledge that I know I've heard, what you've asked me to do, be greater than any doubt or fear because you have conquered all. And why would you not conquer this with me? He's not asking us to respond in favor of others or to predict their response. He's asking us to respond to him. When we look at and use these what ifs, we reduce our ability to work for the Lord. Why? You're looking at the wrong thing. And if you look at the wrong thing, how can you do the right thing? We begin finding a way out rather than trusting him for the path forward. We are meant to focus on the task assigned and let him handle the details. I'm a detailed guy. I like to know the plan. But sometimes you have to put that to the side and say, okay. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He knows more than you. He knows more than me, by far. He's not asking you to know. He's asking you to trust faithfully. And if we step out in faith, he will be there to guide your path, guide your steps, and provide. Overcome the what-ifs by faithfully stepping into what he's called you to. Excuse number four, focusing on our own abilities or our inabilities. So instead of turning the lens outward and saying, Predicting what people may or may say, now we're turning the lens on us and reducing ourselves. It's kind of interesting. Like pride in the flesh is one of those things that is always ready to bubble up. But then when something hard from the Lord comes along, we start to push it back down real quick and be like, I'm not that good at this stuff. What you want from me? <clears throat> First, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now let's go back a couple verses again. When God said, here are the signs that will prove to the children that I am who I am, that I have called you, that you have heard from me. He threw a stick down, his staff, and it became a snake. A little freaky. A little scary to me. I don't like snakes. It's biblical. They're evil. Then he picks it back up. He puts his hand, pulls it out. It's completely white as snow with leper, as a leper. Puts it back in, pulls it out. It's completely healed. God's the one doing the equipping. He's not asking Moses to be ready and perfectly able to do everything. Again, he's asking Moses to step out in faith. God provides the divine ability. but Moses was still focused on him not being good enough. It wasn't about God not being powerful enough. Now it's like, yeah, but am I good enough to be used in your plan? It's a weird, humble thing that happens where we, 
in some ways we recognize how powerful the Lord is, but then we reduce ourselves. But in reducing ourselves and thinking that we're humble, we're actually being prideful because we don't want to do something. It's a very weird way of putting things. Just God wasn't choosing Moses for his capability. God wanted to demonstrate his power and authority through Moses. And he does with you too. God doesn't choose perfect people. Do you know why? Because he can't. <laughs> he did that one time and it worked out perfectly well. He can't do it again. Jesus was the only perfect one. We are not perfect. We understand we're not perfect. And as believers, we know we're not perfect. We know we came through repentance because we're not perfect. And we needed the salvation of that Jesus provided. So why in the world all of a sudden would we think that somehow we're going to be fully equipped on our own to do something? We couldn't save ourselves. How can we move forward in service to the Lord by ourselves? We can't. But God knows that. He's not begrudging of us because we're not perfect in everything. He just wants a humble, obedient, faithful servant. Why? Because he can use that. The humble servant says, here I am. And that's it. Doesn't say, here I am, but I don't want to do that. Here I am, Lord. Well, can you do this? Eh, no. Never said it was easy. God doesn't qual excuse me. <clears throat> God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Y'all get that this morning? He's not calling you because you have some divine ability to do something. He's calling you because he knows you'll be faithful in doing it. And if you step out in that faith to follow what he's wanting you to do, that he can do all kinds of stuff through that. The disciples had no power in of themselves. They were breathed on by Jesus, and that's what gave them the ability to do what they did. Then after Jesus ascended, the Spirit came down, filled them with the power of the Spirit, and that's what allowed them to do what they did. We just have to be able to receive the direction of the Lord, the power of the Lord, and go work. He is asking you to trust in his power through you more than you trust in your own ability. Abilities change. Abilities grow. Weaknesses turn into strengths. Strengths turn into greater strengths, but only if we allow the Lord to work through us. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Everybody say, all grace. All grace. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Did he not just promise you, and that's not the only place he promises, but did he not just promise you you're going to be okay? Whatever the response, whatever the task, whatever the mission, you're going to be okay. You know why? Because he's there. Don't count yourself out when the Lord has counted you in. Last one this morning. This is probably, to me, one of the most, in a way, the funniest ones, because it's, I'll paraphrase it in a second, but Exodus 4.13. <clears throat> but he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand whomever else you want to send. I don't care who you send, just not me. I mean, that's almost like, I, I'm not even sure how much I care about this plan anymore because you're putting me in the middle of it, and that's quite uncomfortable. Send Kyle. He's better at that than I am. Why not Jason? <laughs> he didn't preach today. He's got time. <laughs> but it's all desperation. He's, he's begging to let out, be let out of this mission. After all of God's perfect responses to Moses, showing patience, promising provision, promising ability, showing a miraculous power that Moses will have because of the Lord to do these signs and wonders and miracles to convince people that, yes, it is the Lord that's, that's asking this, that's doing this. He still wanted out. I would have, it would have made more sense in my mind if this was the first excuse. But then you have it as the last excuse after the Lord has clearly demonstrated his power and provision, and Moses is still like, ah, anybody but me. 
We've all seen the power of the Lord, haven't we? And sometimes we just can't take that step forward. The Lord's anger was kindled against Moses for his desire to get out of the mission. But then what do you see again? He didn't smote him. Again, I might have. This is why I'm not the Lord. I don't have that level of patience. He promised him. There's Aaron. He will talk for you. I will tell you what to say. You will work together. You will be a holy team to go and accomplish my purposes. What else do you have? The Lord answered every single one of Moses' excuses or fears or doubts. And he'll answer yours. <clears throat> Typically, excuses and doubts are based upon a fear, where there's a rational fear, an irrational fear. And when fear overpowers our faith, when we allow that fear to creep up and we're not pushing the, f the fear down, we stall out. How can you move forward in faith if fear is higher than your faith? We lose our fervor for the Lord in his plans. Yesterday I was jacked up and ready to go for the Lord. Today I've got a little bit of fear and I'm not so sure I'm jacked up and ready to go. We become stagnant. Why? Because you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at the challenge rather than the provider. When fear overrides faith, we become of no use to the Lord. Think about that for a minute. Two best words in Scripture. But God. But God. Moses gave excuse number one. But God answered that one. Number two. But God answered that one. Number three. But God. He answers every need. Especially when he's calling you to something. Why do we have fear? It's scary to think. many times we've responded with some sort of excuse, one of these excuses, so whether it's a small task or a big task or anything that the Lord's called us to, whether it's those standing orders that we have in Scripture as you go to bear fruit, to preach the gospel, or something special, so to speak. It's scary to think about that. He promises us he will be with us. Romans 8, <clears throat> 31 to 34 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us, everybody say, all things? All, all is everything. There ain't nothing left when you say he's going to give you all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Think about that for a second. Jesus was perfect. He's up there praying for you. You think his prayers aren't going to be answered? Come on now. So <laughs> Jesus is praying for y'all. To go out and do what he has commanded. He's praying for favor. He's praying for success. He's praying for provision. He's promised his spirit. What do we have? What, what are we waiting for? Where fear and doubt lead to excuses, lead to delays, faith leads to action and blessings both for us and the work for the kingdom we are called to. 
don't count yourself out when God has counted you in. He didn't rescue you from sin so you can sit around on the sidelines and watch everybody else work. You're supposed to be in there working. And he will help you work. Don't count yourself out when God is on your side. Guys, what are we waiting for? Don't let, don't get slowed down by anything. And I'm guilty of it as anybody. Let your fear be in the moment. Let your faith in the moment be greater than your fear of anything. Because you don't want to look back and be like, oh, man, again? Lord, I'm sorry. You, you asked me to do this. I knew you asked me to do this, and I didn't do it. And now I'm repenting again. Thankfully, he will allow us to come back to him, and he will forgive us. But guys, we just got to step into it. Jesus never shied away. Why would we? What are you waiting for? Push these excuses down. Push the fear away. Focus on Jesus. Focus on your faith. Focus on the word of God. Praise, worship, whatever you have to do to stay singularly focused on what God has called us to. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that as imperfect as we are, that you still have a desire to use us. You still have the ability to use us. Lord, help us not to fall short. Help us not to lose sight of your power, your grace, your mercy your direction, your guidance, your spirit, your son, your love. Help our faith to be greater than all things, Lord. Lord, I pray for the power of the Spirit to refill each and every single one of us, Lord. I pray for the power of faith to rise up within us, Lord. I pray for a people that we be a people who surrender, who submit every single day over and over and over because you are worth it. You are worthy. Lord, I pray for obedience. Pray for the strength to obey, Lord. Pray for the strength to focus upon you, Lord, and not let anything distract us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the numerous examples in Scripture where you continue to use imperfect people for great things. Let them be a reminder to us, Lord, that it doesn't matter who we were. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter what abilities or inabilities we think we have or don't think that we don't have, Lord, that it's your power in us that gets things done. And help us to focus on that and allow that to be our guiding force. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your provision, Lord. Well, I thank you for your patience. For not giving us what we deserve. But loving us beyond measure and giving us your best. Lord, I thank you for repentance. I thank you for salvation. Thank you for a second chance, Lord. And I pray that we be a people that take advantage of that. That we repay you with the work of our lives. Be with each and every person in this body, Lord. Be with each and every person in the global body, Lord. Help us all to focus on you, on your plans, on your power, your provision. Lord, I just pray for understanding and unity, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.